Good morning, everyone. Glad you are with us this week. I hope and pray that you are doing well. If you have any needs, again, remember, we, we recognize that this is a hard time and we want to be here for you. So if you have any needs, reach out to us. We recognize that this time of staying at home uh, changes everything, that it's been a lot harder than I think a lot of us have thought it would be, you know, being away from our new, normal routine. So we love you and know that us and our team are for you. So please reach out if you need anything. You know, last week I shared that I was pretty bummed we completed the series, The Thread. I loved that series. I loved the book of the Bible, this this incredible story that we get to tell and that the story of Jesus is intertwined throughout it. I love that Jesus is our King and that He will be coming back for us again. And while I was sad that we were done telling that story, I also realized that as we are going into this new series called Greater, you know, the study up through the book of Hebrews, which Brock made an awesome video for, that the story is actually still continuing. Because the author of Hebrews writes this letter, which is almost more like a sermon, and sets off to prove the greatness of Jesus. The author shows that, that Jesus is greater than the heavenly beings and the angels, which we'll talk about today. You know, these powerful beings that we see throughout scripture. The author shows that Jesus is greater than Moses, that Jesus is greater than the law, that he's greater than the promised land, greater than this lineage of priests that we see, and that he is greater than any sacrifice that was before him, and even any of the covenants that we see throughout the Old Testament. Jesus is greater. So throughout the story, from creation into eternity, Jesus is greater. And Hebrews shows us that. Now, to understand the book of Hebrews, you, you need to know a few things about it. One thing is that we don't actually know who the author is. We don't know who wrote it. The author doesn't say. By the text, we know that the person was likely not one of the 12 disciples, but had relationship with the 12. Some think that it could have been Paul, but it also didn't really sound like any of Paul's other writings. Some believe it could have been um, one of the other followers. It could have been one of the female leaders in the early church based off of some of the literary styles and the neglection of mentioning uh, the authorship, unlike what you see throughout some of the other texts. But all in all, the author is anonymous and that's okay because the content was necessary for the time that it was written and the audience that it was written to. Now, we don't have a geographical knowledge of who the audience is, like you see in, in most of Paul's letters, you know, that were directed to a specific church in a specific community, like uh, the Ephesians of Ephesus or the Corinthians of Corinth or the Thessalonians of Thessalonica. But what you do see in this text is that the author knew the people well. And that they were people who were expected to have a very clear knowledge of the Old Testament law. So the Torah. So what we have in the first five books of our Bible. So the reality is, is that these people were most likely Jewish Christians or Christians who were of Hebrew descent. Hence the title Hebrews. Now the date of this letter is also important. Because this letter was most likely written during the time that Nero was the emperor of Rome. And we'll get a little bit to his craziness. But also that it was before uh, the Jerusalem temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And we can think that because uh, the author is continually telling the, the people not to go back to uh, the Jewish traditions like temple sacrifice. Which, in history, we know ceased once the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. But... I want you to know a little bit about Emperor Nero as well, because it's important for the text. See, Nero reigned from 54 AD to 68 AD, and it was during his reign in the Roman Empire that the greatest persecution of Christians took place. It was during his reign that most of the 12 disciples were, were martyred. It was during his reign that, that Paul was beheaded and that Peter was crucified upside down. And I'll be honest with you, since I know that our audience watching with us today is of all different ages, I'm not going to go into the detail, but it's pretty gruesome. Nero did some really bad things to Christians during his reign, like unthinkable things. And the worst of it, you know, this whole persecution was because he blamed the great fire of Rome in 64 AD on the Christians, which was later rumored that he actually started that himself because he wanted to have a new palace, so he was clearing some space. So this was an incredibly trying time to be a Christian in the Roman Empire, which is why the author of Hebrews is frequently encouraging the audience to endure, to not walk away from Christ, because the best way to avoid persecution was denial of the faith, denying Jesus. But if nothing is greater than Jesus, how can you deny him even to your death? So over the course of the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at this letter. We're going to take an expository look at the text, which means we're going to 
dig in, uh, dig into the text, explain it, which is different than what we did with the thread, right? My wife, she explained it like uh, this, this picture, this big picture of the tree that was the entire story, but not the details of the leaves. Well, now we're going to be looking at the details of the leaves, which gives us context to the picture of the tree. So in this first week, we're going to be looking at the first two chapters of Hebrews. And in these two chapters, uh, we will be focusing on this greatness of Jesus, uh, mainly that he's greater than the angels. And this is how the letter starts. It says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So the author opens this thing up by making some parallels between uh, the Old Testament or the old times and these new times, right? There's talk about their ancestors, so their fathers and the mothers of their faith. There's talk about how God used to speak a lot through prophets in different times in a lot of different ways. And for the Hebrew Christians, they would understand this. When they speak of the prophets, it wasn't just the prophetic text in the Old Testament, but it was the historical text as well and, and, and the wisdom literature as well. So that would include books like the, the Torah, the first five books of our Old Testament. Also, some of the wisdom literature that we get with David and, and in the Psalms. The author is saying that in, the, in those days, God spoke in many different ways in very different times, but now he has spoken through his son. It is showing this contrast that this revelation of Jesus is greater than all of that. The heir of all things through whom the universe was made, which echoes the text, right, that we see in John's gospel, that Jesus was there from the beginning. That Jesus is the one who died for our sins, the one who has the exact representation of God's being, the one who is the radiance of God's being. This revelation, it solidifies the word of God in our lives, right? He sustains all things through his powerful words. And even more so, the author is saying now, Jesus is in heaven sitting at the right hand of his father and is in so much more a place of superiority over the angels who were just, who were God's main messengers throughout the Old Testament, throughout the story. We get to see, but see them do that. But Jesus came to this earth, right? Like think back at the thread. It, It was an angel who appeared to the woman at the tomb after Jesus rose from the dead saying, why are you looking for the living among the dead? It was angels who appeared to the shepherds in the fields proclaiming the good news of great joy that was for all people. The news of a savior being born, right? It was an angel who appeared to Mary and it was an angel who appeared to Joseph explaining how this son of God would be born in the most miraculous way. And in the Old Testament, right, an angel appears to Abraham, we see that. An angel appears to Moses and to the prophet Balaam and to Israel and to Gideon. Angels are messengers of the most high God. And yet Jesus became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Jesus is greater, even greater than those heavenly beings that God has used throughout time to speak to his people in powerful and miraculous ways. The author of Hebrews then goes on to to even prove the point more. and He starts quoting scripture, which any good sermon should have scripture that is quoted. But this is why many actually call this letter a sermonic letter because it reads so much like a sermon. But the author is saying, look, did God ever say to angels, you are my son, today I have become your father, quoting Psalm 2-7, or that I will be his father and he will be my son, quoting 2 Samuel 7-14. The author is saying, yes, the angels are great. And in the ESV, the English Standard Version, uh, the, the author quotes Psalm 104 saying that the angels are wind. They're like wind in a flame of fire. And yet verse 6, and again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, Jesus, er, the author says, let all God's angels worship him. He's quoting Deuteronomy 32, 43. The angels are great, but the rest of chapter 1 shows how Jesus is greater. Right? Verse 18, but about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. And that's him quoting Psalm 45, 6-7. He also says in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, 
but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same. And your years will never end. And he's quoting Psalm 102, 25 and 27. Then going back to the angels, verse 13, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? That's him quoting Psalm 110, verse one. The author is saying, And you can see this in verse 14, that the angels are great. They are messengers and ministering spirits to those who will inherit salvation, a.k.a. us, who believe. We learned this last week, talking about the end times, right? This inheritance, Matthew 25, 34, where Jesus will say to those who believe, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The angels are incredible ministers for us. They watch over us. They are our protectors. You see this throughout the Old Testament, but Jesus is God. So what does this mean for the readers? Here's the author's first warning we see in chapter two of encouraging them to not leave Jesus. Verse one says, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard or we may drift away from it. Don't drift away from the truth, he's saying. The author in the next verse points back at the, at the messages delivered by angels to the prophets of old and how those messages always stood, stood firm and how there was punishment for those who disobeyed the law and the instructions. Then the author says, so what makes us think that we can escape if we ignore the great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak? The author is saying, if there was punishment in the Old Testament for disobedience, Now we have the legitimate Son of God announcing this great salvation, which was also explained to us by his followers. So how can we ignore that? I mean, look what Jesus did for us. He goes on to say, look, he's greater than the angels. Verse verse 9, for a little while, he was given a position a little lower than the angels. Meaning when Jesus came to this earth, he became one of us, fully God and fully human. And because he suffered death for us, He is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader fit to bring them into their salvation. This is our salvation. This is what has been placed in front of us. And the author is saying, Don't drift away from this. Don't neglect this. Stay strong in this. Risk your life for this because this salvation is for eternity, not just for this temporary life on earth, but beyond that. And that is why Jesus came for us. The rest of Hebrews 2, it continues this reasoning for Jesus coming to earth and becoming flesh and blood. Verse 11 shows that because Jesus is holy, he made us holy and made us part of his family, that we are his children, that we are children that we are his brothers and sisters. Verses 14 and 15 say, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And remember by this point, Jesus has already been gone for almost 30 years. So there are young believers in this community who have legitimately lived their whole life in fear of death because they believed in Jesus. And the author of Hebrews is saying, you know, Jesus conquered the power of death. He freed us from that fear. Yet we can also know that Jesus is right there with us as we battle our fear, as we battle our temptations, as we are being tested in our lives. The last verse of chapter of chapter two says, since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. So this is what we need to know for ourselves. This isn't some folklore. This isn't a made up story. Jesus isn't just some crutch that has been made up by humanity to give themselves something to put their hope in. What this is, is our God who is above all else, who created all things, who loves humanity, took the form of us, came into this world as as God in human form and he cleansed uh, cleansed us of our sin by dying on the cross for us. And if that was all he did, Yeah, it could have been folklore. It could have just been a good story of a great man. But Jesus, by the power of God, rose from the dead. 
once and for all proving his greatness and proving his power and proving his name is greater than all other names. Now Jesus sits in the place of honor at the right hand of the heavenly father and he has given us eternal salvation if we believe in him. So as we close out this first week of Hebrews, I will once again tell you what the author says. We must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard or we may drift away from it. In this season, don't drift away from the truth of Jesus Christ. But more than ever, continue to lean in. Continue to stand strong in your faith. Don't let the fear of the things of this world take control of you. Because Jesus has already came and conquered fear and death. You are his children. And favor and his blessing is all over you. So don't neglect that. And if you haven't invited Jesus into your life, do that today. Become one of his kids. It's the most important decision you can make in your life. So make that decision right now. Pray pray to yourself simply, Jesus, I'm yours. I believe in you. I want to live my life for you. And if you do this, that eternal salvation that we have talked about is yours. Jesus really is greater than all else. Any of our circumstances, any of our fears, any of our idols, Jesus is greater. And over the course of this series, we're going to continue to prove that. We love you all. And if you are wanting to start a relationship with Jesus today, reach out to us. Make a comment on Facebook. Just say, I need to make that decision. You know, click the hand on Foursquare Live. Leave a comment there or email us at, ya- at help at yakimafoursquare.org. We want to walk this out with you. We love you all. Be blessed, my friends. And I hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we'll see you all in person very, very soon. Love you.